Hey guys, really great to see you again, and welcome to the Church at Line of Judah Sunday, February 19th service. Joining us this week is Dustin Roberts with his touching message titled, Restored Friendships. We hope this message will inspire you to strengthen those friendships and relationships around you. You know, it's great to see you online, but there's nothing like sharing a handshake or a hug. How about dropping in to see us next week? We're at 5732 Douglas Road in Toledo, Ohio. Service times are Sunday, 10.30 a.m. and Friday at 7 p.m. If you'd like to join us in support of our ministry and world outreach, head over to www.lionofjudatoledo.org and click the Donate button. Hey, thanks again for joining us today. Now on to the message. Shalom. Colossians 1 verse 20. It says, And through him, talking about Jesus, just in case you're wondering who him is, to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, Yet Jesus has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. You can be seated. There's a lot to unpack there. But there's one word I want to particularly draw your attention to, and that is the word reconcile. I want to talk to you today about the ministry of reconciliation. I first want to say before anything, is, before I say anything, is that Jesus ultimately, his main purpose for being on this earth was the ministry of reconciliation. And the Bible says actually that now he's giving us the ministry of reconciliation. We continue what he began when he came. But before we can reconcile the world to God, one of the first things we have to do, especially as believers, is be reconciled with one another. And so today I'm going to talk about reconciliation, but I'm mostly going to focus on reconciliation within the body of Christ and in relationships of people that are close to you. And I want to talk about what that means. In fact, Jesus prayed a prayer right before he died. He said, Father, let them be one so that the world may know that you sent me. Oh, you got to understand, if we're broken, we can't reconcile the world. We've got to be one before we can actually do the ministry of reconciliation with the world and God. I want to talk to you about reconciliation. First of all, it's a big word. What in the world does that mean? Well, Merriam-Webster says that reconciliation means the restoration of friendly relations. Now, this doesn't mean that you didn't know somebody and then all of a sudden you got to know them. This means that you were once friendly with someone and something happened to break the relationship and you were no longer on friendly relations. When the relationship comes back together and there's healing and friendly relations are restored, that is when reconciliation takes place. I told you ultimately that Jesus was a reconciler. Uh, Jesus and God, or I should say, God had to initiate the ministry of reconciliation the moment that we sinned. The moment 
In the Garden of Eden, when we decided to break relationship with God by no longer doing and following His commands, we broke relationship and God had to step in immediately to restore. He did some immediate things to restore. He covered Adam and Eve in their nakedness. He, he protected them. He encouraged them still, yet there was still a brokenness that took place. There was still something that happened where the relationship could no longer be the same. And God wanted complete reconciliation, the reconciliation of all things. The Bible talks about it in the book of Acts, actually. It talks about the restoration and the reconciliation of all things. It's the coming of the end of the age. That's what is happening when Jesus ultimately comes back. But Jesus, God, crafted a plan to fix the issue that we created that caused a breakdown in relationship between humanity and God. And he obviously, you know the story, he sent his son Jesus to pay the price for the pain that was caused to pay the price for what judgment should come upon us. See, we don't deserve reconciliation. We deserve judgment. I can't say it again. The, the result of sin is death. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have eternal life. And God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. God wants to save us, church. What we deserve is judgment. But what we got instead was reconciliation. And I want to talk to you about something that I, that, that word reconciliation for the believer is something that we're all called to do and challenged to do. And I want to talk to you today about Paul's, Paul and his work as a reconciler. And I want to talk because when he started his ministry, he wasn't a very good reconciler. In fact, he created some broken relationships. He actually caused some disunity at times and so forth. And I want to talk to you about his maturity and how he grew as a reconciler and talk about what that means for us. But just in case you don't understand that God has called us to reconciliation, I want to read to you some Bible verses first uh, about our call as believers to reconciliation. One of the commands in the Bible is in the book of John, and Jesus said it very clear. This command I give unto you, that you love one another as you love yourself. This is a call to reconciliation. Hebrews 12, 14 says, make every effort to live in peace. Not some effort. Not a little effort. Every effort. Oh, go ahead. Is there anybody that you haven't really made full effort to live in peace with? Oop. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Luke 23, 34. You heard Rabbi say it in the seeds of Revelation today. Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they are doing. Luke 17, 3. Watch yourself. Oh, how many of you are looking in the mirror? Watch yourself. Anytime you hear something like that, that means pay attention. Like that means uh, you may let this slip by if you're not on the lookout. If your brother or sister sins against you, tell them. And if they repent, forgive them. How many times does someone wrong us, we don't tell them, we just get angry with them? 
I didn't say if, if your brother or sister sins against you, get mad at them and beat them up. He said, tell them. And if they repent, forgive them. Matthew 5, 24 says, leave your gift in front of the altar when you come to God. If you have a problem with someone, first go and be reconciled to them. Then come back and give your gift to God. The ministry of reconciliation is so important to God. He would rather you be at peace and that you've and, and he would rather you make the effort to make peace before you come and give him a gift. Do you hear what I'm saying? The ministry of reconciliation is at the core of the heart of God. It is the core of who God is as a being. He wants friendly relations. And if it's broken, he wants to restore it. This is what we're called to do as believers, guys. This is why we are witnesses to the church. This is why we are witnesses to the world. We want to show them that God loves them and wants to reconcile. Paul, you know, I, I just want to, I, I use Paul probably as an example today because... He was a strong personality. And thank God for the strongness of his personality. Because of it, we have letters that more letters in the New Testament from him than anywhere else. And his letters define our faith more than any other New Testament letter that exists. Uh, we're very grateful for him. In fact, Peter actually wrote about Paul's letters and said, pay attention to the stuff this guy's saying. He counted it as scripture. Peter was looking at Paul's letters and said, man, you need to, li it's, it's, it's hard to understand, but it's important. And that's funny. You know why? Because in Galatians, Paul writes about a fight that he had with Peter. Paul, this guy, Paul and Peter get into a fight because Paul is hanging out with the Jews who are saying that you got to be circumcised and you can't eat pork to be a believer. And uh, that's Peter doing that. And Paul's over on this side, chumming it up in it with the Gentiles, saying, you know, everything's good, eating meals, having fun, etc. And Paul rebukes Peter and tells him, dude, what are you doing? You're bringing us under the law. It's not about law. It's about grace. This is the apostle Peter and the apostle Paul and they're having a fight. And I can tell you that a fight like this breaks relationship. This was the kind of thing that Paul wrote about in a lot of his letters. There was separation within the body of Christ in significant manner in the early church over this argument right here and it calls a bit of a split between Paul and Peter yet look at Peter so wise in the latter parts of Peter's life writing about Paul and talking about Paul's letters and to value what's being written in them Ah, oh, see Peter I don't believe Peter stopped where, where we heard there was an argument, I believe Peter came around and Peter valued truth above the hurt that was caused when he was rebuked. Paul didn't probably do it in an easy manner though. He did it with some strong passion. And in this case, with Likely a very good heart wanting to make sure that the church didn't go astray. And if we, if Peter had won this argument, church, we'd all be circumcised and we wouldn't be eating any pork. It's true. If Peter had won this argument, if truth had not won the argument, we'd be going the wrong direction now, church. It'd be different. We wouldn't have a, the full understanding of the gospel that we have today. 
So I'm thankful for people like Paul that, that will stand up for truth and speak the truth. But sometimes it hurts and sometimes it causes breaks in relationship. Another person that Paul had a break in a relationship with was a man named Mark and a man named Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas were missionary brethren. They were set apart for the ministry to go and to go on a missionary journey to proclaim the gospel. And a man named Mark went with Paul and Barnabas. Mark, somewhere along the journey, got sidetracked. I don't know why, it doesn't tell us in the Bible, but somewhere along the journey, Mark decided, uh, yeah, this is important to me, I'm going to go do this. Uh, whatever, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't dedicated to the cause, Paul would say. So they get back to headquarters, and they're going to go on a second journey, and Barnabas wants Mark to go with them again. And Paul says, no. I don't want this man going. He deserted us. We can't rely on him. And then Paul and Barnabas get in an argument. And unfortunately, it was such a big argument that Barnabas and Paul split. And Barnabas and Mark end up going on their own missionary journey here. And Paul goes on his own mission, missionary journey over here. And they end up splitting. It's broken relationships. It was that broken that they couldn't get along. It was. It wasn't just like, oh, we we uh, we um, you know decided to go separate ways. No, I mean it was a it was a passionate argument. It's very clear that it was a passionate argument, and people knew about it. You know how I know people knew about it because in in um. In one, of the, in one of Paul's letters, he writes to the church and he says, Oh, basically, everything's fine with Mark now. And uh, if Mark comes to you, receive him. Paul ended up restoring his relationship with Mark. Not only did he tell others to receive Mark eventually, Paul ends up saying that Mark became one of the biggest blessings to Paul. Why? Because Paul grew in forgiveness and reconciliation. And probably Mark grew in being faithful to the cause. Oh, you hear me? Two people grew in their faith doing the right thing. And because of it, the church ended up being blessed more. Colossians 3, 12 through 17 says, So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility. Here's a good one. Gentleness. Patience. Bearing with one another. And forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. It'd be a problem if Paul was writing this and he didn't forgive Mark, wouldn't it? <laughs> Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another, with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Paul became a reconciler, and it became one of the primary messages that he ended up preaching. In fact, one of the things that he would say at the end of a lot of his letters is he would say things like this. Uh, also, read this letter to this church. 
and get the letter I wrote them and read it to your church. He wanted everybody to be on the same page, saying, speaking, and doing the same thing. He's like, he's like, oh, and I'm sending this person to you. They're your brother. Uh, receive them. There was this one man named Onesimus, and Onesimus uh, was a runaway slave. He wrote a whole letter called Philemon. It's just one chapter. You should go read it. He wrote a whole letter to Philemon to basically tell Philemon, uh, this runaway slave of yours, I found him. He got saved under my ministry. You and I are friends. I'm sending him back to you, even though I'd like for him to hang out with me uh, because he's been a blessing to me. He says, but I'm sending him back to you. And can you please charge any debt he's had, uh, you know, uh, to my account? Uh, Forgive him because he's one of you now. He's saved like you're saved. So receive him as your brother. Oh, Paul is about the ministry of reconciliation. Now, I like this about Paul. Paul did not force Philemon. He actually wrote in Philemon, in the book of Philemon, he wrote to him, he said, although I could charge you as an apostle of Christ and you owe me your whole salvation, I could force you to accept what I'm saying, but I know you'll do above and beyond everything I'm asking. Paul was asking and seeking for healing, forgiveness, and reconciliation. Yeah, uh, you know, Philemon in the Roman Empire, if you were a runaway slave, you were, you were, you know, you're seen as property. You, you, you're, it's death on sight. Uh, That's where a lot of the crucifixions would happen. They would just, if you catch a runaway slave, they would crucify them there on the side of the road and leave them there so that they could be seen, so they would know not to run away. And Paul here, here's Paul advocating for forgiveness for this young man who's run away, saying, receive him as your brother and he'll be a blessing to you like he's been a blessing to me. Paul began to advocate for forgiveness like crazy. One thing I just love, I just tell you this little tidbit. At the very end of this letter, Paul says, "Uh, also prepare a bed for me uh, because I know I'll be released from my chains because you're praying for me. I'm coming. Basically saying, if you don't do all this, I'm going to get you because I'm coming. (laughs) I I think it's funny. Um, I'm not sure that's what he was saying, but I kind of read it that way. Especially since the whole letter is about this. And he's like, one more thing. Prepare a bed for me. (laughs) So I think that's kind of funny. But either way, um, Paul is advocating for reconciliation. And that's what he's doing here in Colossians. And he's doing it throughout all of his books over and over and over again. Paul matured. And the ministry of reconciliation and forgiveness is not something that is quick for us when we're not saved. It's something that we grow into, that as we're sanctified and as we mature as believers, it's something we're able to do. And ultimately, we don't forgive because someone deserves it. We forgive because we were forgiven. And the more you realize that you've been forgiven, the easier it becomes to forgive. The Lord's Prayer, simply put, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others who trespass against us. It's built into how Jesus taught us to pray. Colossians 3.13, bear with one another. Oh, bearing with one another means to be patient and understanding in relationships. It means to not let minor disagreements become major issues. There's a marriage tip. It's a call to practice humility and to put others before yourself. It's also a reminder to forgive, to be kind. Control your anger. The Bible says be angry and sin not. You can be hurt. You can get angry. And yet you don't have to tear someone down. You hear me? You can be hurt and get angry. And yet you don't have to tear someone down. You can tell someone how you feel.
without accusing them and breaking them and causing more pain. I want to give you some tips today on how to be patient and show some understanding. There's a couple things in the Bible, um, what it looks like uh, and so forth, and some verses that go along with some of these things. Number one, uh, the Bible says that we should be slow to speak and quick to listen. This is how reconciliation comes, church. This is what I'm giving you tips for. Tips for reconciliation. Slow to speak. Quick to listen. We always want to be heard. And in fact, when someone else is speaking, oftentimes what's going through our mind is what we're going to say in response. We're not necessarily taking in what the person is saying. And because of it, we can't respond properly. One of the biggest issues in relationships today is the lack of empathy. It's one of the biggest issues in couples' relationships today. It's when someone shares with you, I feel this way, and you think, oh, I'm not really sure why you feel that way, it doesn't make sense, etc. And you do not identify with those feelings, and you begin to immediately jump to that opinion, and they're not able to move on in the conversation because of that, and then they begin to... You know, they get tight and, and, and maybe animated or they start to speak louder as if that's going to fix it. It's not. Then both people become wrong. One person is defensive and the other person is, it becomes rude and mean or condescending. And it's, it's a bad pattern of cycle. We got to be slow to speak and quick to listen. And... I just want to say another thing, another tip here is don't, don't take everyone's hurt so personal as if you're this bad person. They might be saying it in the wrong way to you. We don't really know how to talk with each other. Oftentimes, I think uh, we're not taught that. We're taught in grade school to be the biggest person and the strongest person, not the, the softest person. <laughs> we're taught stand up for ourselves and be strong, you know, uh, especially men. Uh, these days, our, I, I was telling them Friday, men are no longer, we're not conditioned to use our strength for good. We're conditioned to use our strength to be the best. Uh, who can, who can dunk the basketball the best? Who can jump the highest, leap the furthest, run the fastest, catch the football and get many touchdowns or throw it and be the goat like Tom Brady? <clears throat> or lately, Patrick Mahomes, huh? Um, but that's what we're taught to defend ourselves, to be strong. And Jesus said, be, be as wise as a serpent, but as harmless as a dove. Let's be harmless in our, in our talking with one another. It'll help with reconciliation. Let's go to the next tip. I, we should focus on the goal instead of, of finding a resolution rather than trying to be right. And that verse that I think that really salutes um, where, where I heard that is, if, it's, if it is all possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do everything that's possible. It doesn't mean that you don't share truth, right? But let's do it with wisdom and let's, let's work in a way on finding the solution more than trying to be right about ourselves. And this goes both ways in relationships. It's not just one way. Luke 17, 3 through 4 says, Watch yourself. I know I read some of these earlier. If your brother or sister sins against you, tell them. If they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. How many of you uh, married folk know what it's like seven times in a day? <laughs> Your argument, you come back 30 minutes later, you're arguing again. You know? Otherwise, it's probably hard to get in a fight with someone seven times a day if you're not married to them. You know, it's prob that's probably tough. So I just imagine this was for married folk. <laughs> I hope they're repenting. If you do something wrong, just say, I'm sorry. It doesn't make you less of a person. 
you're just human. Just say I'm sorry. And uh, be okay with yourself too. That's what it says here. It says, it says if they repent. So if you, if you mess up, repent. This is keys to reconciliation. If you mess up, if you did something wrong and you hurt someone, say I'm sorry. It's one of the keys. It, it, it is the key even to salvation. You understand we have to receive Jesus gift. We have to say, ah, forgive me of my sins. Then we can be forgiven. But also in this same verse, there's another key. We have to forgive. Maybe you weren't the one who messed up. Maybe you messed up too. I don't know. Either way, you also have to forgive. Someone is seeking forgiveness. If someone is seeking to do right, forgive. Why? Because you were forgiven. You've been forgiven of so much. Now let me caution you here and let me say something here. Forgiving does not necessarily mean that you should allow someone to walk all over you and to mistreat you. I'm not saying that someone should be allowed to mistreat you. My daughter, I think, was reading the Bible this last week and she was telling me, like, Dad you know, but we're supposed to be friends with our, with our enemies. And I, and she was saying it's so hard. And I was like, Oh no, I, that's not how I read the Bible. I don't think I didn't see Jesus as friends with, with those who were trying to stone him. He might forgive them. Uh, but, but the people he was friends with were like disciples and, uh, and, and people who took care of him, people who loved him. Those are the people he hung out with and were friends to. He, he tried to live at peace with people who mistreated him, but he wasn't necessarily their friend. He had enough, in other words, he had some healthy boundaries too. So I'm not telling you that forgiveness means to just release every single boundary and just get close. See, God had to sanctify us. God wanted, God forgave when Adam and Eve sinned, but he still set up a boundary until we could get right and Jesus could come and fix us so we could get to heaven. That's why we're, <laughs> you understand, there's some boundaries there, okay? But... We have to forgive. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you're doing now. A key to reconciliation? Show appreciation for other people. Appreciate what they bring to the table. I'm sure they've got their faults, so do you. Appreciate what they're bringing to the table and so into it. So into it. So into what someone around you does that's good and right. Build them up in that. Encourage them. It's probably their gift. And it'll be a blessing to you. James 1.5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. What am I saying here? You can't do this on your own. You're hurt. It's probably if you have a broken relationship and you need reconciliation, you're hurt. Pray. Pray for grace. Pray for strength. For God's wisdom. Pray for patience and understanding. These are fruits of the Spirit. God does want to give that Spirit that was on Jesus to you. And I want to tell you something. Jesus had to pray. Let's stand to our feet. Jesus had to pray for reconciliation. See, sometimes the cost of reconciliation is painful. Because somebody truly did do something that hurt you. You understand, if somebody didn't hurt you, you probably have friendly relations. I'm talking about real emotions and feelings here, guys. Jesus didn't want to die on the cross. He didn't want to go through the pain. He had to get on his knees and he had to pray till he sweat drops of blood. And God sent an angel to strengthen him. He needed his spirit to be strengthened so that you and I could be reconciled to God. 
He practiced humility probably better than any of us could ever hope to live up to. He washed the feet of people he knew were about to betray him right before he died. And he told them that they were going to do it at the same time. <laughs> the same message. <sighs> Reconciliation takes humility. Philippians 2.8 says this. Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to God unto death. Jesus had a right to be right. He had a right to call every angel to come down and rescue him off the cross because he didn't deserve the punishment he was being punished for. But reconciliation was more important to him. And I want to tell you something. The brokenness of our relationship with God was more important to him than the sin and pain that we've caused God. And God calls us to have that kind of heart. Not, I know it's not always easy and you can't just immediately be okay with someone. I'm not telling you ignore your emotions and your feelings. I'm telling you submit them to God. Take them to God. Find out what God wants for your heart and how He wants you to think and how He wants you to feel. And, and I promise you, oftentimes, he may, he may tell you to separate and get some space. I don't know, but oftentimes, it'll often lead to that statement Jesus cried out on the cross, which was, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. 